Hi, I want to talk to you about the most influential person in human history. So influential that he split time. Even the very times that we live are set around him. Every time you write the date, you proclaim Jesus. For all of time is broken down into AD and BC. What kind of a person splits time? Who do you think that Jesus is? Jesus. He's my best friend. He's the Lord Saviour. He's my everything. Our God. Um, Jesus can be whatever I need at the time, but most of the time I see him more as a sort of big brother role, you know, um, guiding me, cheering me on, encouraging me to be everything that God designed me to be. I think Jesus is the Messiah and he's the, he's the coming King and he's the Saviour of the world and of my personal being. Um, someone I can go to for anything. He's like having a friend that you know is never gonna leave you. My safe place. My everything. He's my BFF. Jesus is the Son of God and he is also the Saviour, my Saviour and the Saviour of mankind. He is Lord of all. Jesus is, is the, the King of our life and the King of this universe and that's why we come to church every Sunday. A lot of people have tried to answer that question. Some people have said that he was a prophet. Others have said that he was a good teacher. The problem with that is that he himself claimed to be the son of God. Now, a great prophet points to God. A great teacher says, this is the way to live. But Jesus said, I am the way. You see, Jesus personally proclaimed that he was God. He said, if you've seen the Father, you have seen me. So we're left with this issue. If he himself said he's God, he either is or he isn't. If he's not, then what options do we have? He was either a liar or he was self-deceived. I love the way Josh McDowell puts it. Josh McDowell says that he was either a lunatic, a liar, or he was Lord. He was either personally deceived, he wasn't in touch with his own reality. He was a very sinister, divisive liar, or he is who he has proclaimed to be the Son of God. Now, let's consider those three options for a moment. Could he indeed have been mad? Well, a lot of people have proclaimed their God over the centuries, but Nobody else has had millions, in fact, billions of people follow them. Today, on the planet, he has influenced over two billion people. Uh, the first four books of what we call the New Testament, the Gospels, are a record of what he did and what he said. And what's so incredible is what he said over 2,000 years ago has found its way into our modern day language. You might call someone a good Samaritan. Where did that term come from? It came from Jesus 2,000 years ago. You might refer to a prodigal son returning, again, had its origins with Jesus. He taught us to turn the other cheek, to love your neighbor. Uh, these are not the babblings of a madman. These have influenced our culture and have helped us become who we are today. I'm afraid I can't settle for the conclusion that Jesus was not in touch with reality because his teachings have helped create the reality that you and I experience today. So if he wasn't mad and he wasn't God, the only other option is, is that he was, well, a liar. He was a crook, a thief. A criminal. But if that's true, then uh, he's probably the only liar in history that lied to get himself into trouble. You see, Jesus died the most excruciating, painful death upon the cross for one single reason. The reason why the Jews had the Romans crucify him was not due to anything that he had done. He hadn't broken any laws but that he proclaimed himself to be God and then backed it up with power. You don't crucify everyone who claims 
that God, sometimes you get those people some help, if you know what I'm saying. But no, he claimed he was God, and then he backed it up with power. Not for selfish gain, not to try to get himself ahead. No, his claim that he was God got him killed, got him crucified. I've never met a liar or a deceiver deceive themselves towards their own death. No, I'm afraid it doesn't stack up. He couldn't have been crazy and he couldn't have been a deceptive liar, which just leaves us with only one other conclusion, that he was who he said he was, that indeed he was the Son of God. Now, interestingly, if you want to study the Old Testament, the, the Jewish Bible, there are over 200 direct prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ. And they are very detailed. And each one of them was fulfilled. Uh, it was said that he'd be born in a town called Bethlehem, a very small little village of just a few hundred people. But sure enough, it boasts the birth of Jesus Christ. It was said that he would be crucified uh, on a cross and not a bone in his body would be broken. Well, we all know he was crucified. You may not have been aware that not a bone in his body was broken. And what's so strange about that is that's how you die on the cross. They break your legs. You can't draw breath anymore and you suffocate. And yet when they came to break his legs, the Roman uh, soldier recognized that he was already dead and didn't bother. All of these prophecies have come true, which leads me to believe that he was indeed who he said he was, the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So why does the death of Jesus Christ matter? It happened over 2,000 years ago, on about as far away from this particular geographical point as you can get. Uh, of course, it's not just the fact that he died, it's also the fact that he rose again. And if those things actually happen, if they are historical truths, then I want to say virtually in comparison, nothing else matters. And if anybody can predict their death and resurrection, then I want to hear what they have to say. See, the body of Jesus was never found. The Roman authorities wanted to dispel the myth, so to speak, of Jesus' resurrection. They could have pointed to the body, but the body was nowhere to be found. The followers of Jesus Christ were killed not for what they believed, and this is important. People die for what they believe all the time. They weren't killed for what they believed, they were killed for what they had seen. They saw his resurrection, therefore they couldn't deny it. In fact, over 500 had seen it. Within a few years, people as far away as Rome from Palestine were believing it, while there were still eyewitnesses. That's why nobody could dispel it, because people had seen it and had passed it on. His death and his resurrection, they really matter because the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So I think deep down inside we know this. I think deep down inside we know that there's something wrong. There's something broken. Uh, we set standards for ourselves. We don't live up to it. We've all seen our actions or the actions of others hurt and break relationships. See, what, what you need to understand is that sin is not what you do. Sins are things like lying and cheating and stealing and so forth, and nobody wants to do those things, but that's not what sin is. Sin is when you put yourself at the center of your own life, a place that was supposed to be reserved for God. So we take God out of the center of our life and we put ourselves there. We become, if you will, our own kings. And that is what sin is and it's this thing called sin that has damaged our relationship with God. See Christianity it's not about behavior modification. You haven't got to turn over a new leaf. It's kind of like you know it's not that the house is broken and somehow Jesus might come and fix it. He, he pushes it over and he gives us a new one. If you have a glass of water and you put some poison in it well you can't take that poison out. You've got to get rid of the water and get a whole fresh glass. That's what God does for us. We have been contaminated by sin. And we can try to stop this behavior and that behavior and turn over a new leaf and frustrate ourselves till we are red in the face. 
or we can realize that our problem is sin. It's destroyed our relationship with God. And there's only one antidote, and that is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And let me explain to you why. There were two people, and they were friends, and they were uh, uh, separated um, as they entered into their adolescent years and went two separate directions. One became a judge, and the other became a, a criminal. And one day the criminal was brought into the courtroom and it was his friend who was the judge uh, adjudicating on his case. Well, the judge had to apply the law even though he was his friend. And uh, the fine for his crime was $5,000. So the judge was duty bound to apply the law. But then because he loved his friend and his friend had no means to pay, he paid the $5,000 fine. One man paid the fine for the other. That's what Jesus Christ has done for us. You see, you might think, well, I'm, I'm a good person. You know, I, I try to do the right thing. I try to make sure my behavior is acceptable. And uh, the issue is, how do you determine that? And most of us determine that on the basis of comparison. If I was to compare myself with, say, Adolf Hitler, you know, I'm not that bad. Uh, Mother Teresa, I'm not that good. But, you know, I, I'm in the middle. I, I'm, uh, I, I'm towards the better part of, of, of being good, you know. Uh, I'm compared to my brother or compared to the people who live across the road. Oh, I'm not doing so bad. And of course, the problem is you don't set the standard and I don't set the standard. God sets the standard and the standard is perfection. And I don't live up to it. And I think if you're going to be honest, you don't live up to it. That's what the Bible means by for all have fallen short of the standard of perfection. And the wages of that, the result of that is death. Now in the Old Testament, you can read it in the Old Testament, you see they would sacrifice animals. Uh, more often than not, it was a lamb. And, and uh, this was to, uh, to pay the price, if you will, for their sin. But Jesus is called the Lamb of God and we don't have to make ongoing sacrifices. He's paid the price for our sin once and for all. Life on this earth was perfect. Then sin came and destroyed it. But then God sent Jesus Christ to restore us back to that original sense of perfection. Why does the cross matter? I've got to tell you, it's the most important event in human history. Because when Jesus died on that cross, he was paying the price for yours and my sin. So I want to encourage you, Take your next steps in your walk of relationship with him. We'll have a baptism that's coming up soon. Why don't you contact us at the office and find out when the next baptism is. Make sure that you're there. And of course, tune into the next video. Pastor Tim is going to talk to us about what faith is and how we can have faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us. God bless you. And I hope this was a meaningful time.